as soon as I look at the document, we can start. All right, so the last time we started discussing in the Yoga Sutras chapter three, the various siddhis, the supernormal powers. This session we will continue with the supernormal powers. There are quite a few of them. Some of them may appear quite incredible, and I will try to help you understand how these are possible with some examples. We left off at verse 18. You may have noticed that the Yoga Sutras are always in groups of three, sometimes five, ten verses. And this group, verses 18 to 20, is Samyama on mental impressions. Samyama, as I explained in the last session, is very deep absorption. It's a combination of dharana, dhyana, and samadhi on the on one object. <clears throat> so, verse 18 says, Samyama on the impressions of the mind or witnessing leads to the knowledge of previous births. How is that possible? We know that samskaras are stored in the mind, in chitta, that in modern, modern terminology we call the unconscious mind, active as well as latent, and these impressions are stored there, and all the impressions also from previous births are stored here. If we go to our diagram, and we see the yogic anatomy. Then we see here that in the active as well as latent unconscious mind are the various samskaras. And as we begin to get conscious of what is in the unconscious mind, it is no longer unconscious. It becomes conscious. So this is the part that we are aware of, the conscious mind. This is what we identify with. So here you have habit patterns, thinking patterns, and this is what you associate yourself with. I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm Indian, I'm American, I'm German, etc., etc. And these are identities. As we become aware of the things in the unconscious mind, our self-identity expands, keeps expanding as we get to know more and more. And this is the process of witnessing. When we witness, if we are able to do that, we become aware of what is in the active and latent unconscious mind. So what is there? There are the impressions of the past, past memories from this life, from your childhood, for instance. All that you have suppressed there, painful memories, or desires that were not fulfilled, fears, deep emotions, strong emotions, all of these are in the unconscious mind including the memories and impressions from previous births. So as you get to know yourself, you also get to know about your previous births. This comes forward. The latent and active unconscious mind comes forward and brings with it ancient memories. Any questions about this?
<clears throat> so we have the idea of Samyama on the impressions of the mind itself. That means the entire chitta begins to come forward. Verse 19 explains further, by witnessing the impressions of one's own mind, one gains knowledge of other minds. So how is it that if you know your own mind, you begin to know the mind of others? For one, the construction of the mind is the same. We saw the diagram and this diagram is the same for everyone. There is no difference. This is the basic concept and it applies to everyone. The mind is also analyzed in the sense of manas, buddhi, chitta and ankara. So everyone's mind has the same setup. If you understand yourself, you begin to understand others. When we feel pain and we suffer, we can empathize the pain and suffering of other people. When you lose somebody close to you, then you also will understand what somebody else goes through when that person loses someone dear to him. Similarly, when you understand the makeup of your own mind, how it is set up, you begin to understand also the mind of others. We also know things like that about 80% of the communication that we have between ourselves is unconscious. We reveal our true feelings through body language. So even though someone may say uh, something, his body language might betray his true thoughts or feelings. So also, someone who knows himself really well his, his samskaras and has a deeper insight into his own personality will begin to understand what others are experiencing, feeling, thinking. So much so that such a person may know others better than they know themselves. Why is that? We can see here that this is the aspect we know of ourselves. We know our body and we know a bit of our conscious mind. We know the world around us, more or less. And our self-awareness is generally quite limited. But somebody who has this kind of awareness, he knows his latent as well as active unconscious mind, he understands all of this. Body, conscious mind, active, unconscious mind as well as latent mind. And he will see this person who is only at the level of conscious mind and body. He will know him better, understand better what is going on through him in his mind. While that person himself may be so limited in his own thinking and self-awareness that he is he doesn't know himself. This is one of the reasons why <clears throat> meditators, good teachers who are meditating and who know themselves are sometimes uncomfortable to be around because this teacher sees through the student. The student might say something that the teacher might know better and say this is perhaps what you really are thinking this is what you really are talking about so those who have a deeper understanding of themselves also understand 
people around them better. <clears throat> if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Verse 20, only knowledge of the fluctuating thoughts in the mind can be obtained and not the cause, since the cause is not the subject of observation. So when a person who knows himself is observing others, he can only observe these superficial or fluctuating thoughts in the mind, but he may not know the deeper cause behind those thoughts. For example, you invite somebody to your house for, for a meal and the person says yes, but you see from his expression that he is not really very keen, he's very reluctant with little bit of self-observation and keen observation, you are aware that even though this person has said yes, he in fact doesn't maybe really want to come. So from this observation, you see the superficial thought, but you do not know the cause. You do not know why this person does not want to come and accept your invitation. So also, <clears throat> when a yogi or a meditator, a person who knows himself, observes others, he sees the more superficial thoughts and feelings, but he cannot really know the cause of these thoughts. You can understand this verse from the idea of merely observing. It's a very keen observation, very, uh, a very sensitive person, for example, notices when somebody is uncomfortable in a certain situation. Those who are not very sensitive, who are not very aware of their surroundings, they do not notice their surroundings at all. They're so revolving around them, their own selves that they do not notice how another person is feeling. So we can understand this Siddhi as expansion of awareness. The greater our self-awareness, we become more aware also of our surroundings. So these three verses were Samyama on the mental impressions. The next group of verses is Samyama on Tan Matras. Tan Matras are things like sight and sound, taste, smell, touch. So verse 21 says, with samyama on sight itself, cognition of light from the body can be suspended. The body becomes invisible. Now this sounds quite uh, like quite a superpower. And you'd say, okay, great. I can become invisible to people. How shall we understand this? You all may be aware that there are people who are very shy, they like to hide, they remain in the background, they are not very loud or, or even very communicative, they are very quiet. And it happens sometimes that you don't even notice them. 
you see that sometimes with children. There are children that are very loud and noisy. They, they grab your attention. They demand your attention. And there may be a couple of children that are very quiet. And they sit somewhere in a corner and you even forget that they're there. So in a sense, these people are invisible. Because unconsciously, they want to remain in the background. They're shy. Now imagine that what somebody does unconsciously can also be done consciously. It is, it's an attitude. Verse 22 is Samyama on sound and with Samyama on sound, cognition of sound can be suspended. In certain commentaries, this sutra has been dropped. In a sense, it's an extra sutra because the same is true for all the Tanmatras. It's also true for taste, for sound, for smell, for touch. And <clears throat> the principle remains the same. This brings us to a very important verse, and that is verse 23 of chapter 3, Samyama on Karma. Karma is either fast fructifying or slow fructifying. By performing Samyama on Karma, one gains knowledge of the time of death. So, first of all, we need to understand what is fast fructifying and what is slow fructifying. The example given is that of a wet cloth. If you take a wet cloth, you spread it out, it will dry very fast. But if the wet cloth is just put in a lump somewhere, it takes very long to dry. That is slow fructifying. When you spread it out, it dries fast, that's fast rectifying. So basically, we all have some scars to live out. And we know that these are stored in the latent and active unconscious mind. What one has to live out leads to birth, it leads to lifespan, and it leads to experience. It's called jati, birth, ayush, lifespan, and bhog, experience. So whatever is in this storehouse, known as karmasaya, also known as the unconscious mind, that has to be lived out. The total karma that needs to be lived out is called samchitta karma and it has been accumulated in this life and in previous lives. Then there is prarabdha karma which is to be worked out in this incarnation. So according to your samskaras you have got a certain body you have got a certain birth which allows you to experience those things that you want to experience. If you have animal tendencies, you would be born in the body of an animal. If you have tendencies or qualities that need a human body to manifest them, then you get a human body. Also, the kind of human body you get depends on what you need to experience. So lifespan also depends on, on these experiences that you need to live out. Kriya Mana Karma is the new karma that you will generate in this lifetime. And if it is lived out, then it is done. If it has not been lived out, it will be added 
to the rest, which has to be lived out then in the future or in future lifetimes. In order to know or gain the knowledge of the time of death, we therefore need to really have an overview of our karma. To go back to our diagram, we see in this diagram that the total karma is here, it's stored here in the active and latent unconscious mind. To have an overview of this, you need to be at least at the cause and level here. So your expansion of your consciousness has taken place and you are already at the causal plane. This is the causal plane. The latent unconscious mind is the causal plane. That's where the really deep seeds are buried here. And they manifest out of the latent unconscious. They play themselves out in the active unconscious and eventually they play themselves out in the world. Therefore, to be able to tell the time of death, you need to have the overview of the entire storehouse of karma. If you are able to live out this karma very quickly, it is fast fructifying. It may reach a point where you say, I don't need to live out anything anymore. The body is no longer required, at least not that body. If you have other karma stored in there, it requires a different kind of body, then perhaps you return. But if you are able to witness the entire total storehouse of samskaras, then you become a witness and eventually you attain total liberation. Knowing the time of death is a bit like a doctor who can diagnose your disease you know, if you have a cancer or some terrible disease and you don't have very long to live, the doctor can tell you approximately how long you have. And you may say, oh, you have three months, you have six months, you have a year. So also, if you are able to have an overview of all the karma, in the mind, what is stored there, then you can tell whether it's fast fructifying or slow fructifying. Fast fructifying karma is very, very useful for those who are on this path, meditation, and want to free themselves of the binding power of karma and their samskaras. They want to burn these up in the fire of knowledge and they want to have systematic practice which brings these forward and burns them up in this fire of knowledge. And that is then fast fructifying in the sense that it doesn't really fructify but it's burnt up. But it can also be fast fructifying if you do it consciously with full awareness and say, okay, this needs to be done. I will do this and it's over. On the other hand, most people, they go through a very slow process. And so most persons have mild fructifying or slow fructifying karma. Any questions on karma, samskaras?
This is a very interesting topic on karma samskaras. I do recall that recently when <clears throat> I asked in one of the Facebook groups about topics that people are interested in, karma and samskaras got the highest number of votes. Excuse me. Yeah. Radhika Ji. Yeah. So I just wanted to uh, see my understanding. So what you're saying is that if if we wish, we mm. practice that if something is mild fructifying, it can you can speed it up. Yes. It's not decided in advance. It can be speeded up. Yes, it can be speeded up through a process of witnessing, process of self-awareness, meditation. Yes. Okay. A lot of suffering that people go through is because the, the karma is uh, not being worked out. So the suffering also manifests on a physical level. And what can happen then through a process of meditation is that this comes to the surface in awareness. And if it comes forward in awareness, the suffering at the physical level disappears. But the mental process is also quite difficult to go through because as you keep expanding your awareness, you also come in touch with those darker aspects of yourself, which is one of the major reasons why most people stop meditating because they find it very difficult to look at these aspects of themselves. We have both. We have the good as well as evil parts of ourselves. While none of us think of ourselves as evil, we do have certain tendencies which could be described as evil. Things like jealousy, envy, uh, anger, all these uh, in a certain form are evil tendencies. Sounds Evil sounds very strong, but um, that's what it is. And uh, they, they, they're difficult to look at. If you have created a self-identity, which is a very nice one, and I'm a nice person kind of identity, and uh, then this comes forward and is looked at with full awareness, it disappears. It's the example of the snake in the dark. You think, oh, that object lying there, you know, oh, that's a snake, oh, I'm terrified of it. But the moment you put on the light, you see it's only a rope. So the moment you look at certain qualities, they seem to disappear. It's self-awareness is that light in which they disappear. And this process is speeded up through meditation and which leads to liberation. So in certain traditions, we talked about this in the earlier chapters of the Yoga Sutra where we talked about methods that are um, mild, medium and speedy. And we said that mild methods, well, are things like, you know, chanting and uh, religious uh, rituals, etc. And then there are speedy methods, which are the, the internal yogic practices. And the medium methods are those that are generally mixed. You have to do a little bit of both. And uh, expanding self-awareness is the key, basically. Thank you. So a question is, what's the difference? How does one differentiate between, between dharma and karma? How does one know what one's dharma is? For that, you need some self-awareness. Um, generally, dharma is 
in conventional wisdom, I say, it's translated as duty, and people follow these ideas of what they think their prescribed duties are. You may have a duty uh, as a father, you have a duty as a son, uh, you have a duty as an employee, etc. And however, while it works for most people that way, others who may be a little bit more contemplative and start questioning themselves, for them, this is obviously not satisfactory. For this, you need to have more self-awareness. So you find out your dharma only with greater self-awareness. Okay, Samyama on various qualities. On performing Samyama on various qualities, such as friendliness or compassion or goodwill, these qualities are strengthened and intensified. Sorry, that's a mistake there. It's cultivating certain qualities in oneself. We see whether it is compassion towards the suffering or goodwill towards the virtuous, friendliness towards everyone who is also friendly. Merely by contemplating on this idea, we are able to strengthen this quality. As I mentioned, we have both positive as well as negative qualities in us. We have the evil as well as the noble tendencies. With a little bit of attention, we are able to activate certain qualities. If you meet someone, even though you're not feeling well and perhaps you're not in a very good mood, if you see a little child, you immediately speak in a very soft voice. You're very sweet to the child because a child brings out these soft, loving qualities in you. It's very difficult to be rude or nasty to a little child. I know there are people who are doing that, but it's um, for most of us, that would be quite difficult. And we know that we can sort of switch on these qualities. So with just with attention, these qualities can be intensified and strengthened. Verse 25, however, says, by performing samyama on the quality of strength of an elephant, this quality can be acquired. So we see that we can acquire different qualities merely by focusing our attention on them. When the mind is one-pointed, when you really want to have certain qualities, the mind becomes one-pointed. All the doubts are, have been removed and you say, yes, I want to have the quality of, for example, success or love. It doesn't mean that you just mindlessly keep repeating love, love, love. But love is already there in you. By focusing your attention inwards, you find it, you activate that samskara and you strengthen it. In a sense, it, even though it's put as a siddhi here, I think we all can understand that. We all have situations where you may feel a negative quality, as I mentioned the example of the child. 
when you you somehow don't feel good, you're you're irritable, you're in a bad mood. But when there's a small little child who comes to you, you just find those reservoir of love in you, and you activate that. Similarly, we can do the same with success or any other quality that you may wish for. This is one of those siddhis which a lot of people would love to have because there are a lot of people out there who's, who want to be maybe successful or wealthy. And this requires a one-pointed mind. As I said, both the qualities are present in us. What happens in practice is that the moment you focus on one quality, its opposite will also surface. So if you focus on success, I want to be successful, the opposite quality, which is failure, will also get active. Because even that is in the unconscious mind. If you want wealth, suddenly the doubts will bring forward poverty because this is a world of dualities. Our mind has both the qualities. These are dualities. So in order to really achieve these the samyama on a certain quality, you need to have either extremely strong willpower that you can push away those negative traits or you need to resolve those negative traits. That is, allow them to come forward, witness them and they lose power over you. And then you are able to strengthen the positive quality. Remember, however, that these kind of siddhis or this kind of um, way of focusing on strengthening qualities that you want to strengthen and letting others go is still within the domain of the mind. This will not lead you to liberation. You will remain at the level of the active and unconscious mind by focusing on these qualities. So those who want liberation should realize that all siddhis are actually obstacles and will keep you stuck at the level of dualities. To go beyond the dualities means to also go beyond these qualities and learn to witness. By focusing on certain qualities, you are not witnessing. You are strengthening certain qualities and remaining in the domain of duality. The same goes for a quality like fearlessness. To be fearless means you need to observe, witness all your fears and resolve them. Because the moment you say, I want to be fearless, guess what's going to come up? All the fears come up. That is how it is in practice. In theory, of course, it sounds nice to say that focus on friendliness and qualities of friendliness will come to you. Focus on the strength of an elephant and you become as strong as an elephant. Verse 3.26 Performing samyama on the light within, one gains knowledge of the subtle, the hidden, the distant. The light within is that most sattvic part of ourselves, of the mind. The most sattvic part of the mind is buddhi. Having a direct experience of the voice of wisdom within, of buddhi, is 
like a light. When you have access to this, to buddhi, this really sattvic part, it cuts through all the layers of the unconscious mind, of manas, the self-identities, the, the created by Ankara. It cuts through all the, the memories and the, the fears and the desires of, of Chitta. And it sees things very clearly. And it gains the knowledge of that subtle. What is the subtle? The subtle is all the samskaras, the karma, which is in the unconscious mind. That is hidden. What is hidden? The active and the latent unconscious. It appears distant. This is very, very deep intuition as well. It's not sensory knowledge, it's intuitive knowledge. And so it also tells us about the distant. Many of us may have experienced this, that when you think about somebody very intensely, suddenly that person will call you. Because there's some sort of connection, which is going beyond distances. It's The person can be very far away, but when there's that connection at a very deeper level, that person feels it and responds to it. So Buddhi has access to deeper planes, like the causal plane, and has intuitive knowledge, which comes from very deep within. Verses 27 to 35 is about Samyama and chakras and other focal points. Before we start this, I'd like to say that many commentaries have interpreted these sutras in a completely different manner. Most of these commentaries are based on academic studies, they are written by scholars, and not uh, based on a meditative lineage or those who are meditators. So it has happened before that uh, I have read a translation, for example, of the Upanishads, where the translator, uh, a British um, scholar, writes, he translates it in a certain way, then he puts a little footnote there and says, this verse can also be translated as follows, but this makes no sense. And to someone like myself from a meditative tradition, that footnote made sense, but his translation did not because he was thinking in an intellectual manner and he could not understand what is happening during meditation. So he, he did not see the clues. He did not see the references to, to the meditation part. So the following verses are, I will explain to you why they have been translated in a completely different way by scholars. So verse 27 says, performing samyama on the solar entrance, pingala, one gains knowledge of the conscious worlds. Now, academic scholars have said solar entrance, they're referring to a part in the body. They refer to solar system, the sun, and they refer to the fact that by uh, studying the sun, you get full knowledge of the solar system, which of course is possible. 
actually, if you start observe the, the skies and mm. the stars and the, the, the heavenly bodies, you will get knowledge of the solar system. But is this verse about the solar system or is this referring to the solar system in the body? What is the solar entrance? This is Pingala. For those who have looked at my book or read my book, Mastering Pranayama, it explains how one meditates on Pingala, Ida and Pingala. It's based on the shifting of the breath principle. When one is concentrating on Pingala, Pingala is related to the sun or consciousness, the conscious aspect of the mind. The waking state is the conscious world. The external world around us is the conscious world. Therefore, by performing Samyama on Pingala or the solar entrance, one gains knowledge of the waking state and of the external world. What kind of knowledge is this? It's not merely in the sense of, yes, I am conscious right now, but there is more to this world. This world is a macrocosm. And there's also a microcosm. There are layers of consciousness. These are called the lokas. And with deeper meditation and understanding of Pingala, you will have knowledge of these different worlds of the ma macrocosm. Verse 28, performing Samyama on the lunar entrance, which is Ida, one gains the knowledge of the unconscious world. What is the unconscious part? What is the active and the latent unconscious? Either or the moon. Moon has got reflected light. Right? It doesn't have its own light. Similarly, the unconscious mind doesn't have its own light. It is reflected light. So this is referring to the active and the latent unconscious. And to the connection between the two. How the, the unconscious mind is continuously affecting and manifesting in the conscious mind and world around us. Verse 29, by performing Samyama on Dhruva, the immovable center, Sushumna, all worlds are known. Now, these commentaries talk about Dhruva is the polar star, North Star. And it says by focusing on the North Star, you will get to know the, all the heavenly bodies and astrology and astronomy. And I don't really see that as a, um, as a Siddhi. I don't think to be an astronomer <laughs> is a siddhi or a power. So for me, it is very clear that there's a deeper, subtler meaning to this. And it is Sushumna, which is the immovable center. It is also known as Merudand, which means that part in the spine is like the center. And all the chakras are the different layers of consciousness. That's the microcosm. And the same is true for the macrocosm. So by performing Samyama on Sushumna, the dualities merge. You reach a non-dual state and you become a witness. And all worlds are then known to you. There is, of course, also a connection to the heavenly bodies. 
we are deeply connected to these. And this connection between the heavenly bodies and the human body is the basis of Jyotish Vidya, the science of astrology. And it can help to change one's karma and destiny. Some of you may have read stories like in the autobiography of a yogi, um, even other stories like in Living with the Himalayan Master by Swami Rama, where some yogis use uh, precious gems in order to change one's destiny or to uh, to, to prevent certain unforeseen circumstances which are which might be unpleasant to to be made milder and that shows that there is a connection between these heavenly bodies and our own body because microcosm macrocosm these are related we are deeply connected to the universe the nature around us when the conscious mind or a set of identities hankara would not be so strong so rigid and we would have greater access to the deeper wisdom within us you would be able to begin you'd be able to see these connections and once again to be able to see these connections we need to have access to the unconscious mind that's why balancing both the lunar and solar aspects of the body and getting self-knowledge is what these verses are about while these verses are referring to these different focal points it is in no way a recommendation for anybody to start focusing on any of these focal points this should generally be done in together with the guidance of a teacher who has a comprehensive knowledge of these various points reading from books and practicing various uh, kinds of meditation um, is in the best case just a waste of time simply because it's not systematic any questions so far any comments Yeah, sure, go ahead, Rafael and Lucia. seems to be taking a little longer i'll just continue and if you're writing and typing in your question you can go ahead um verse 30 yeah you can continue with your question i will <laughs> i will answer it once you've finished it verse 30 says samima on the navel chakra leads to complete knowledge of the body and its energies are mapped Navel chakra, Manipura chakra, is the largest chakra in the body. From an anatomical point of view, from a physiological point of view, this is also the largest network of nerves in the body. So it is really um, a powerhouse of energy. And blockages in this area are major cause of disease 
In fact, in Ayurveda, one says that all disease, almost all disease originate here in the area of the stomach. And removal of these blockages lead to total health. Uh, in my book, Pranayam, Mastering Pranayam, I have also spoken about this chakra and um, practices like Agnisara, which are very useful for removing the blocks here. We talked about the energies being mapped there. So Samyama on the navel chakra leads to knowledge of the body, leads to knowledge of all the pranic vehicles. And um, this is at the level of the pranamaya kosha, which is uh, the second layer. And of course, there are deeper layers of prana as well. So all the same, it is very useful to have a, a, a good knowledge of the body uh, energies because health is uh, really a blessing. To have a healthy body is a great blessing. Um, so the question from Rafael and Lucia, since you mentioned the importance of studying with a master as opposed to intellectual reading, we'd like to hear more from you on why it is so important that one learn from a single master in a single tradition. Um, that was a question, yes. Well, um, first of all, studying with the master is not quite what I said, because um, there are traditions that are a little bit intellectual traditions. Many of the Vedantic traditions, for example, that have cropped up uh, in India, as well as the modern neo advaitite traditions, are very intellectual. A lot of books are read, a lot is discussed, but there's little practice. And so what I meant is not necessarily study, as in textual, scriptural study, but guidance um, with a teacher of a meditative tradition. Only this will lead to direct insight. Studying textbooks, uh, texts, sorry, scriptures will not lead to direct experience. Because this will purely remain at an intellectual level. Moreover, what happens is misinterpretations. I just mentioned about the British scholar who, who translated something from an intellectual perspective and in the footnote he put another translation and from, from a person like myself from meditative tradition, the footnote was in fact the accurate translation. So when somebody reads things in the sense of studying at an intellectual level, you misinterpret the scriptures. And apart from that, there are so many scriptures out there, so many translations. It's, it's huge. I mean, it's confusing. It's uh, very difficult to find good translations. And so there already is a big obstacle. Why one teacher, one tradition? Within the tradition itself, <laughs> there are sometimes teachers having different opinions or different interpretations. It's like saying you, you have a problem, physical problem, and you go to five different doctors. They're going to all have a different opinion. It's, it's natural that um, the human mind is about chemistry. It's how you get along with certain people. It's, it's more about chemistry, actually. So it's important to find a tradition that you resonate with and also a teacher that you resonate with. And uh, jumping from one tradition to the other, jumping from one teacher to the other, is not very healthy. It will set you back in your development and your practice. Traditionally, one gives the example of uh, person digging, you know, he digs one meter for water, then somebody says, go dig there. And then he digs somewhere else another meter. And he keeps digging a third place, another one meter. 
Now, had he dug in one place three, four meters, he would have hit water. So it's important to go deeper and not to just keep jumping from one thing to another because that remains shallow. In the Bhagavad Gita, this is referred to as shallow flooding. And we want to go deeper. And that's why it's important. Initial stages is very possible to, um, to experiment, to look, because obviously you need to find somebody you can resonate with. Um, but at some point of time, one needs to decide. It's a bit like a marriage. You know, you may have different uh, um, relationships and partners, but at some point of time, you think about this and you say, hmm, I, I want to share my life with somebody. And at some point of time, I need to, to decide on one partner. Or with the profession. You can't one day decide you want to be a doctor. The next day you say, uh, next year after doing one year of training in medicine, you decide to be a lawyer. The third year you decide to be an engineer. That doesn't work. That will lead to, to confusion. So it's a bit, <clears throat> a bit like that. Needs to, one needs to have a bit of focus to go deeper. Take this last question from Jenny Lowe. Are solar and lunar referring to chakras or different? Solar and lunar is referring to the nadis, Ida and Pingala. This is the interpretation from a meditative tradition. If you read an academic, scholarly translation of the Yoga Sutras, they will say that solar is referring to the sun and lunar is referring to the moon, heavenly bodies. And the siddhis you are getting out of this are that you understand the solar system. And I, I don't think that getting to know the planetary solar system is a siddhi um, of some, some great attainment. So, because it's very external. So therefore, from meditative tradition, we refer to the two nadis, the dualities, Ida and Pingala, and also finally Sushumna. Okay, so I think it's a good place to stop here at verse 30. And we see you next time. Have a nice weekend, everybody.